Okay, welcome back to class. We'll continue with First Timothy chapter six. Uh, so we're looking at the last uh, two verses, the last section where he's telling Timothy to guard what has been entrusted to him. Okay, uh, verses twenty and twenty-one. So can somebody read verses twenty and twenty-one, please? First Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. Can somebody read that? I'll read. Yeah. Thank you, Kanan. O Timothy, God <coughs> that was uh, committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and ideal babbling, uh, babblings and uh, contradictions of what is fa falsely ca called knowledge. By professing it, uh, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Thank you, Kanan. So here, uh, Paul is ending uh, this letter, uh, telling Timothy to guard what has been entrusted to him. So he's admonishing Timothy to guard, which means to keep, uh, to preserve, to watch over uh, what has been given to him, uh, the truth of the gospel that has been given to him, the ministry that has been entrusted to him. Now we know that uh, Timothy was with Paul for 18 years and in this 18 years Paul has taught him, the, Paul has trained him well and so he's telling Timothy to guard all that has been committed to his uh, care okay and then he's also telling him to avoid getting into things that uh, falsely called knowledge you know people uh, uh, who have got into these false teachings they think that it is the right knowledge the true knowledge but he says it will only end up drawing people away from the faith and so he's saying don't focus on intellectual arguments because they have no fruits they bear no fruit they only end up from uh, you know, taking people away from the truth and away from God. And so he's telling Timothy, you know, you guard the fruit of the Spirit that has been given to you. Guard the gifts of the Spirit. Guard the anointing that he has been entrusted or been given to you. <clears throat> and we see that Paul, you know, when he later writes Second Timothy from Rome, uh, we see that he's uh, directly and specifically will write to Timothy, instructing him how to live as a man of God. Okay, so that is the end of uh, chapter six and the end of uh, First Timothy. Uh, and the key takeaway from this chapter six is verse six, where it says, Now godliness with contentment is great, great gain. Okay, so it's important uh, for us as believers uh, to live godly lives, to live content lives. Because if we live lives that are content, then we are not running uh, to make more money. We are not looking for uh, pri privileges. We are not looking for honor. We are not looking for more position. When we want more position, we are trying to pull others down. Uh, we, sorry, we fight for positions. Uh, we can do anything, uh, even compromise uh, things to get into places of leadership. And even when we want, you know, a big house, big uh, car, whatever, we can do things, even as ministers of God, uh, to compromise things just to uh, gain more money and to be more rich. So he says, you know, be godly and be content. And I think that is a key takeaway for us as well. But we need to learn to be godly and to be content. Okay, that is the end of First Timothy. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? No? Any questions you have? Before we move to Second uh, Timothy, I would like uh, each one of you to at least share, you know, what was your key takeaway for in uh, First Timothy? Okay, what did you, if you learned anything new, if something is impressed upon your heart, uh, what is something, are your key takeaways, it can be more than one, 
or it can just be one. So we'll do that uh, just uh, so you can keep thinking about that uh, because I want each one of you to answer. Uh, before that, we'll just decide when we can have our uh, tests for uh, uh, on First Timothy. Okay, we're going to have four tests, one for First Timothy, one for Second Timothy, then Titus and Philemon. So when do you want to have your test for First Timothy? Any suggestions? No suggestions? Okay, then uh, can I suggest 16th February? Is that okay? Or is that too early? Do you want 16th or 23rd? Are all of you in the class? Can you please type in the chat section whether you want 16th or the 23rd or you can unmute your mics and say whether you want 16th or 23rd, please. 16, Thomas says 16th, okay. All are going with Thomas. Both are good. Thank you, Kanan. Anyone else? Okay, both are good. Okay, then we'll go with 16th because most of you are okay with 16th. Okay. Uh, so we'll have yeah okay so now uh, can each one of you just take a couple of minutes to share what was your key takeaway in first Timothy Thomas would you like to start Okay, ma'am. Uh, things are there, especially for the people, those who are serving in the kingdom. They should have the good testimony. It's very, very important. A person can stand and preach uh, the whole scripture, but if he didn't, doesn't show in, uh, in action in his life, people won't follow and people won't take any message from him. And that would be a bad example, but our conduct more than our words. So he says that if a servant of God has, should have the good testimony. So that part is really touched my heart. And uh, many things are there talking about the mark. Uh, especially in the ministry, three things, according to me, is very important. One is name and fame, uh, money and the character. So money is a very, very important. Uh, where many uh, men of God has fallen into the trap of money uh, because of their ministry, their vision, their mission, everything lost. They lost the connection with the God itself. That's why Jesus said he served two masters. So that's uh, so we have to be very careful where we are, how we're handling the money. That's very important. At the, at the same time, he's talking about the masters. Whether we are in ministry or in a secular job, we have to be in a godly manner. We have to obey the masters. We have to respect and honor the people who's above us. So these are the main things uh, what I've taken from this chapter. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, okay, we can go to the next person. Dave? Shall I say, ma'am? Yeah, sure. Th Kiran, go ahead. The Lord... Uh... Being an example uh, that touched my heart at first, being example, the living godliness and all. If we do our part and we walk uh, by faith and all and humanity and chapter 6 and 11, verse 11 to uh, last part 21, the all is touch uh, me uh, so much and all. 11 verses saying, but you, O man of God, free these things, pursue righteousness, godliness faith love peace and gentleness and fight the good fight of faith the and whole internal life to which you were the called that part is very nice and all and touch me very being an example we have to uh 
I have to walk uh, being an example other then after my younger brother and sister they can see me and all and they can glorify to God like that we uh, I have to walk and I have to move taking uh, righteousness holiness and all things uh, from God and walk by faith in all. Amen. thank you thank you Kiran so anyone likes to share about what was your takeaways from chapters one to chapter six yeah like kiran said you know set an example we paul says even in in chapter writes in chapter four says set an example in word in conduct in love in spirit in faith in purity so we need to set an example in all of those areas yes erin you can go next yes uh yeah one thing uh the really took me away from uh, chapter 6 is uh, like uh, like you mentioned from verse chapter uh, chapter 6 verse 1 to 2 is uh, our life our life is like a uh, open book i mean uh, open bible to the unbeliever it's not uh, that it's uh, it, this line really took me away because uh, it's not only for the unbeliever but even to the believer because uh, i heard some of uh, our friends they told me that uh, they didn't want they don't want to go to church or they don't want to attend the church because most of uh, most of the leaders in the church uh, in in this generation they used to uh, preach about love faith but they don't ache uh, right after the church service they used to uh, they, they don't act the way they preach so I this line really took me away and the second thing is uh, like as a servant of, servant of God, uh, we need to have a right attitude uh, in our heart. Uh, and that's and third is uh, that as a servant of God, as a leader, we need to have a good character and we have to be humble uh, while, while we are serving. Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Adam, for sharing. Uh, Kanan has written... Uh, how to deal with false teachers in the church, the responsibility and qualifications of church leaders. Still, there are many things, but I like these things from uh, First Timothy. Okay, thank you, Kanan. What about Dave and uh, Prince? Dave, you'd like to share, Prince? Okay, godliness. Prince says godliness doesn't mean for gain, for making money. And from chapter one, love must flow out from a pure heart. Okay, thank you. So we're left with Dave. Are you there, Dave? Okay, we'll uh, move on to... Second Timothy chapter one. Okay, uh, before we look at uh, chapter one, we will look at the introduction to Second Timothy. Uh, you know, so far Paul has uh, completed almost twenty-four years of ministry. Uh, he has traveled to fifteen major cities, um, and for eighteen years, we see that you know Timothy was with Paul, and. Uh, um, just after his first Roman imprisonment, he travels to uh, Crete, he leaves Titus there, travels to Ephesus, he leaves um, uh, Timothy there because of the need of those churches and uh, because they, they require a godly leader, somebody to oversee things, to take in charge, to set things in place in order. And then we see that Paul uh, leaves Ephesus and then he travels to a few more cities and then he goes to Rome. Uh, and then in Rome, he is imprisoned for the second time. This is around AD 67 to 68. And um, and he knows that his second imprisonment, uh, you know, he knows that uh, death is uh, surely, uh, it's going to end in death. Uh, and death is like looming large over him. And then he writes, uh, so he writes uh, the second letter to Timothy, uh, which are his final words of instructions to his son in the faith, okay? Uh, we also see him writing, uh, requesting Timothy to come soon, but it really does not happen because uh, 
He's uh, martyred sh shortly after he writes this epistle in AD 68. And the tradition, uh, you know, reports to us or mentions that he was beheaded. Uh, since he was a Roman citizen, it's like unlikely he could have been put to death in any other manner. Okay, uh, so we just completed looking at chapter uh, First Timothy, uh, chapters one to chapter six. Uh, we see there Paul's giving instructions to Timothy and how to lead uh, the local church of believers at Ephesus. Now, Second Timothy is more personal, where Paul is sharing more specific instructions to Timothy on how to live a life as a minister of God, okay? So we look at um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, okay? Uh, can somebody read verses 1 and 2, please? Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Mm, we don't have, um, no. Okay. Sorry? Can you just open your Bibles and read, please? And can I read? Yeah, sure, Kanan. Oh. All an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and the Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. So here... Uh... Paul is again acknowledging that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ and he is not an apostle because he has called himself an apostle or he feels he's an apostle or he's doing the work of an apostle and so he's given himself this designation. Uh, no, he's saying that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Okay, so it's God who determines who will be an apostle, who will be a prophet, who will be a priest. It's God who determines that. Okay, and he says that he is an uh, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, this statement, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, is a very unique statement that he's mentioned here. Uh, compared to the other greetings in other Paul's letters. But he mentions the, this phrase according to the promise of life here. And it is so appropriate because Paul was imprisoned again. And he knows that he's going to face death uh, very, very soon. Um, uh, because he's mentioning about this later on in his epistle. Uh, but yet here he, you know, uh, mentions this profound truth uh, that, uh, you know, we have as a promise that Paul also has as a promise. And here the promise of life, the word life here in the Greek is the word zoe. Now zoe is the eternal life. It means it's the God kind of life. And uh, so he's saying that, you know, he uh, has the promise of life. That means he has the promise of eternal life. Yes, he's going to die very soon. He'll be killed, but he has this assurance or this hope uh, of this eternal life that he's going to receive, that he's going to live with his maker, his creator, his savior, that is Jesus Christ. So this phrase, according to the promise of life, is very unique here and not mentioned in other greetings um, uh, in Paul's other letters. And then he says, grace, mercy, and peace. Uh, and he says, grace, mercy, and peace comes to us from? Who does it come to us from? Who gives us grace, mercy, and peace? From Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ, God. He is the source. He is the giver of uh, uh, and the one who blesses us with grace, mercy, and peace. And we see that his grace, mercy, and peace is unlimited, okay, and abounding. And hence, we also can pray every day that God bless me with your abounding, unlimiting grace, mercy, and peace. We can also pray this for others. Uh, we can pray the same when we pray for others as well. Okay, now we'll move on to verse uh, 3. Can somebody read verse 3, please? Yes, ma'am. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. 
night and day i constantly remember you in my prayers okay thank you here he uh, paul is saying i serve god with a pure conscience now if you are reminded that you know earlier in his letter uh, in first timothy he paul emphasizes again and again uh, these words pure and good conscience he mentions this at least three times now he's saying the same thing here in relationship to how he has been serving god okay and it's a good lesson for all of us uh, who desire to serve god that when we serve god we need to serve god with a clear good and a pure conscience okay only when we serve god with a clear conscience a pure and a right conscience then we can live right before god and man and in, paul says that he has served god with a pure conscience as his forefathers did that is you know abraham isaac and Jacob and all those in the lineage, uh, you know, all of them, Paul says, have walked righteously before God and man, and uh, they have walked in the revelation that you know they had or they received at that time, and they did what was right in the sight of God according to the revelation they received uh, or uh, they heard or they learnt at that time. Now in this age and this time, you know we have greater revelations. Um, we have received more revelations than how much more should we live our lives right, honouring and pleasing and worthy in the sight of God. Okay. Uh, and Paul's uh, mentioning his affection uh, for Timothy uh, and his, his affection for Timothy is so great that he's saying that he continuously remembers to pray for Timothy. Okay, so also we learn a lesson here that, you know, we need to continuously pray for people, pray for people in need, pray for people we know, and we need to pray for them continuously, pray, pray for those who have not received salvation, pray continuously uh, till they are saved. We'll move on to verses 4 and 5. Can somebody read verses 4 and 5, please? Okay, I'll read them. Greatly desiring to see you, be mindful of you, your, your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And I call to remembrance a genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your ma mother, uh, you, Eunice. And Eunice. I am persuaded is uh, Eunice. And I am persuaded is, is in you also. Thank you, Thomas. So here, um, you know, Paul is uh, mentioning his desire. He greatly desires to see Timothy. So he writes about it, but sadly, and uh, he's not able to meet him because shortly after he writes his letter, he's martyred. And uh, he's uh, saying he's mindful of uh, your tears. That means he, Paul remembers the tears that Timothy shed in their last parting when he leaves uh, Timothy at um, Ephesus. And uh, he, uh, he then goes on to talk about the genuine faith, okay, that was passed on uh, through the generations uh, to Timothy, first from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And, um, uh, Tim uh, and Paul says, I'm sure the faith is in you as well, okay? So we see how the faith... Uh, was passed on from his grandmother to his mother, from his mother to uh, Timothy. Um, and that is what God desires. He desires the faith of one generation to be passed on to the succeeding generations, to the next generations. God desires the spiritual truths, the anointing uh, to be passed on from one generation to the next generation. But we know that this does not happen automatically. Uh, we have to, each generation has to work to ensure that this happens, uh, first of all, we need to be very careful uh, to model our lives before our children and our grandchildren, uh, model lives before the youth and the children in our church, um, because that is what genuine faith looks like in everyday life. That's when they will know what genuine faith looks like in everyday life, okay? We know that children and youth don't like to be preached at, told what to do, told what not to do. Uh, all they are learning is um, by just watching us. So through our very lives, 
you know, we need to model to them uh, our faith, our walk with Christ, our relationship with God, and uh, the genuine faith, um, uh, what it means in everyday life. Uh, children will and grandchildren will see it when they look at us, the way we live, the way we work, the way we walk, the way we talk. Okay, uh, there's a classroom saying, <clears throat> sorry, there's a saying that in the classroom, things are taught. Uh, at home, more things are caught than taught. Okay, I'll repeat that again. In the classroom, things are taught. Children are taught things in the classroom. Okay, but at home, more things are caught than taught. That means children catch more things by just observing their parents, their grandparents, than they are being taught. So, so important for us to model <coughs> a godly lifestyle. Uh, because children are catching what we are saying, we are doing, our behavior, our attitude, and they're learning from us. Verses 6 and 7, can somebody read that, please? Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the lying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of the sound mind thank you kiran so here paul is reminding uh, timothy to stir up the gift of god now timothy was a very uh, gifted person uh, uh, you know, he had a great number of good values that were beneficial for the kingdom of God, to be a leader, to be a servant of God, to be a minister of God. Um, but uh, Paul has noticed that even though he is very well gifted, he has all the characteristics, attributes, um, uh, nature of being a good leader, strong spiritual leader, but he's seen a a timid streak in, um, you know, um, in Timothy. Tim Timothy is very timid. Uh, so for this reason, we see that Paul is often encouraging Timothy to be strong and to be um, bold. Okay. Uh, we also see, uh, we also gather information or it also appears that Timothy might have been uh, reluctant to exercise his spiritual gifts uh, Perhaps he feels intimidated because there are people who are older to him who are leaders. And suddenly he's a young person here put in this church and he has to tell the leaders what is right, what is wrong, tell them what to do, what not to do, and all of those things. So he's feeling a little intimidated and, um, you know, uh, maybe not feeling too bold to carry on his responsibilities. So we see in First and Second Timothy, uh, you know, uh, 25 different places you know, we see Paul encouraging Timothy to be bold, not to shy away from confrontation, to stand up where he needs to stand up, to be strong um, uh, because of who Timothy was and the responsibilities he has to bear. And uh, we see that he keeps on repeating this or mentioning this again and again because he knew that Timothy had to hear this. He needed to be constantly encouraged. So here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he's encouraging Timothy. Um, uh, sorry, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul encourages Timothy not to let his youth hold him back. Uh, you know, from fulfilling his responsibilities, but he encourages him, exhorts him uh, to exercise his gifts. Uh, in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, uh, Paul says, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy and laying on of hands by the elders. And again, here, Paul is going on to tell uh, Timothy, you know, uh, stir up the gift, uh, gift of faith okay it reminds him to stir up the gift of god which is in him through the laying on of hands now what is the meaning of stir up what's the meaning of stir up what's the meaning of stir up It means to uh, kindle a flame, uh, to fire up, you know, uh, to keep it alive. He has to be more zealous, to, you know, be more passionate, to stir up the fire uh, that is there, uh, to keep burning strong. You know, when you make fire, you keep on, uh, you know, uh, 
you know adding more sticks or uh, or uh, more wood or you keep blowing air so that it uh, it becomes more uh, the fire gets more stronger okay you stir up the fire so it means to kindle a flame uh, to fire up yes to keep burning uh, okay and to be strong okay so how do we stir up uh, the gifts that god has given us okay how do we stir up the gift of god that is in us come on that's quite simple how do you stir up the gift that is in you in the sorry thomas by that gift what did you say say that again exercising that gift by okay faith. thank you exercise the gifts that uh, that has been given to you don't let it just be dormant just don't receive and keep it but exercise it use it uh, yes kanan says through prayer and practice yes praying uh practicing uh you know stepping out pra- uh, using the gifts that god has given you kiran says by praying uh words speaking the words uh, of faith words of scripture uh by putting into practice yes kingdom words yes it's basically you know through worship a personal worship time with god corporate worship praying uh it's also through uh, reading god's word um and uh, also you know like most of you said exercising the gifts the more you use the gifts the more stronger it becomes in your life okay so that is how we stir up the gifts and so paul is telling timothy stir up the gifts which is in you through the laying on of hands laying on of my hands okay so the spiritual gifts we see that can be imparted to us uh it can be initiated in us or get started in us uh you know when one believer lays his hand on the other believer or we we know the spiritual gifts can also be uh, imparted or activated uh you know by one believer into another believer okay the reason we can stir up and step out uh, or the gifts that god has given us is because the holy spirit you know is the one who fills us the holy spirit who gives us the gifts is the same holy spirit who empowers us okay he he's uh, he's dunamis you know a dynamite the word dynamite comes from the word dunamis dunamis is powerful okay so he, the holy spirit has power he gives us the power uh the holy spirit fills us with power with love and a sound mind that is talking about sound mind here is meaning self control discipline uh and self governing ability okay so um that is what he mentions here you know uh for god has not given us a spirit of fear but a spirit of power love and a sound mind so you know may often we don't use our gifts so we don't exercise our gifts because of uh fear we are afraid what if we say things are wrong if we it doesn't happen the way we have said it uh people will laugh at us people would um, uh mock us okay but uh, don't let fear hold you back uh don't be afraid don't let the fear of uh, failing hold you back don't uh, uh let the fear of being wrong uh hold you back from exercising your gifts uh, don't be afraid uh just have this assurance that it, these gifts of the spirit uh are you know given to you by the holy spirit and uh, he fills each one of us like uh, you know it says it fills us with power that is his dunamis that is like a power as powerful as a dynamite that can destroy a building entire city okay uh he fills us with his love that is agape love talking about god kind of love and a sound mind sound mind is uh, a mind that is self controlled uh, disciplined and has self governing ability so it's interesting that paul mentions these three power love and self control in the context of using the gifts of god so we know that the gifts of god when we use it we exercise it with the power of we exercise it in the power of god we exercise it with the love of god and we exercise it in 
the self-controlled manner. Okay, so when you exercise the gifts of the spirit, when you flow in the gifts of um, uh, wisdom or knowledge or prophecy or you know interpreting of tongues, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you need to understand or know that you're exercising this in the power of God, with the love of God, and in a self-controlled manner, okay? Sometimes we see people who exercise the gifts, they are totally out of control. No, the Holy Spirit is somebody who helps us gain control, maintain control, and do things in a lot of, in a self-controlled manner, okay? So don't fear uh, don't hold back your gifts, but stir up your gifts, use it. Uh, the more you use it, the more you will flow in it. The more you're using it, you're exercising your faith uh, and this belief that the Holy Spirit is going to work in and through, uh, through his power, with his love, and help you to exercise it in a self-controlled way. Let's move on to verse 8. Can somebody read verse 8, please? Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me. He is prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Thank you, Kiran. So Paul is saying, therefore, Timothy, you know, uh, he has just told him about uh, the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Uh, and he says... Uh, you know, uh, use, exercise your gift with courage because that is the birthright of every believer in Christ Jesus. Now he's telling Timothy how to let what God has given him to guide his thinking, okay? Uh, in the view of the spirit uh, that God has given us, you know, let us not be ashamed about speaking about Jesus or about our Lord and Savior. So he says, don't be ashamed uh, about preaching and teaching the right doctrine, the truth, the wholesome truth. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Uh, don't be also ashamed of identifying with genuine ministers of God, even if they're suffering for the sake of the gospel, even if they're suffering for Christ's sake, uh, but share in the sufferings of the gospel. And basically, Paul is writing this because towards the end of this letter, he's mentioning few people who, you know, deserted him or disowned him because he was in chains, because he was in imprisonment, and um, he because he was imprisoned, and also because he's going to die soon. So they broke contacts with him. Uh, they disowned him. So Paul is telling him, don't, uh, you know, um, be ashamed of identifying with genuine ministers of God who are suffering, being persecuted, or being imprisoned because of the sake of Christ, because of preaching the gospel. And he's telling him to share in the sufferings of the uh, gospel, because God's power, uh, that is his dunamis power, his miraculous working power, uh, not only enables us to uh, you know, flow in mighty signs, miracles, and wonders, but his power, his dunamis power, also enables us uh, to take part in the sufferings for the gospel. Okay, And Paul is saying, according to the power of God. So Paul actually suffered according to the power of God. God, which means that the power of God uh, is always there, okay, it's always available, uh, but it's, uh, his power does not remove the difficulties that we will face. Sometimes God's power is always also available to see us through the difficult and the challenging and distressing situations that we face. So when, you know, when we are uh, believers flowing mightily in the gifts of the spirit you know we think that the power of god is made available only for us to do mighty signs miracles and wonders and to preach his word no but his power is also available for us uh you know um uh, to see us through the difficult times um uh, and to remove the difficult situations that we are um facing so this is another important dimension of the working of God's miraculous power, that his miraculous uh, working power has the ability to even help us endure sufferings, that is persecutions, hardships, op oppositions for the sake of the gospel. Okay. So verse 9, can somebody read verse 9, please?
Verse 9. Who have, who have saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was in Christ Jesus before time began. Thank you, Thomas. So here, this is a very powerful and a fully, you know, loaded verse. Um, there's so much in just in this one verse. It says here that if we are saved, then we are automatically called. That means when we are saved, we are also called and we are called and this calling is a holy calling it's a call to holiness it's a call to living a morally pure upright life in christ jesus okay so paul is saying here that god has called us to his own purpose and his grace he's not called us according to our works our achievements, our successes. So our calling is not based upon how good we are, the good works we have done, or our accomplishments or success. So if you have a PhD, it does not mean you God will call you to be an apostle or a prophet. And if you just have a basic degree, then he will call you to just be somebody who is an evangelist or a pastor. No, our calling is, uh, uh, is not or the purpose that God has for us and this calling is not dependent on the good works that we do. It's not dependent on our achievements, our success, uh, but it's all purely his grace. Okay, he's called us to his own purpose and grace. So we all have a calling, we have a purpose and, uh, and all this is according to the grace of God. Okay, so God calls us to his purpose and he gives us the grace to walk in the call and the purpose that he has envisioned for us, that he has purpose for us, that he has called us to. So we see that there is something that God has planned even before time began. Okay, because uh, it, it, it mentions here that, um, you know, he called us, he's given us... Uh, uh, in Christ Jesus, even before time began, okay? So it refers to God's foreknowledge of things. God has predestined, pre-planned everything, even before the creation of the world, even before you and I were born, he, had a, he has a plan and a purpose uh, for us. We can read about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 as well. So this is a very wonderful thing that, you know, uh, God, uh, uh, when we are saved, you know, he, we are automatically called and he gives us the grace to uh, fulfill his calling. Okay. That means, ma'am, we are chosen before we are born. Yes, we are chosen uh, before we are born. But uh, we need uh, to understand this, that, uh, you know, um, uh, predestination, uh, one of the uh, you know, theological aspects of predestination, it does not mean that uh, God is being partial in choosing some for eternal life and choosing some for uh, eternal death. No, uh, because that's not what we read. Uh, we read in scripture that it's God's good, perfect and uh, will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so when we say that God cho uh, chose us even before the creation of the world, it's basically that we, he knows that we are going to make a choice to, uh, of, you know, uh, receiving him as our Lord and Savior. Okay, so he knows beforehand and that's why he has purposed this for us. So God is sovereign. We need to understand and ex and. Uh, uh, choosing based on his nature of being sovereign. God is sovereign. He purposes things. He has his own plan, purpose, will that he wants to bring about in history, in our lives. But also the other part of his sovereignty is that he has given us the free will, the free moral will to choose. Okay, so we can choose. Um, and if we choose, we go according to his plan and purpose. If we don't choose, we go according to our own plan and purpose and we bear the consequences of it. So did God know that Adam and Eve were going to eat from the tree that he asked them not to uh, eat from and then, you know, everything that he created perfect is going to be imperfect and sin is going to come into the world? Yes, he knew that. Uh, and he also has a plan for it. Okay, so in his sovereignty, it does not mean that because God has given us the free will to choose, it does not mean that it's going to make God 
uh, insecure or uh, uh, you know god is going to intimidate him uh, you know in his position oh now what should i do you know uh, adam and eve made the wrong choice no god already knows that they're going to choose he already has a plan uh, to fulfill his purpose uh and he will bring about his plan and purpose irrespective of the wrong choices that we make okay so that is the whole aspect about choosing and choice so when we say god god predestined it's not that he's showing favoritism or partiality no his his other nature is he's not a god who's partial or shows favoritism um but he knows the choices that we are going to make beforehand okay so uh, we'll move on to us i uh, did i answer your question uh, kiran you said okay thank you ma'am okay okay verse 10 can somebody read verse 10 please but now it has been revealed to us through the coming of our savior Je uh, christ jesus he has ended the power of death and through the gospel has revealed immortal life thank you so paul knows that he is going to die but he says that jesus is his savior and he says that he has life and immortal immortality through the gospel through him being saved because of what jesus has done so the lord jesus uh, is our savior um and jesus came uh, to reveal the purpose and the grace of god and jesus we also see fulfilled uh the eternal plan of salvation that god had in mind even before the found creation of the world or the foundation of the world so jesus truly shows us what god is or who god is and his what his plans are all about okay and we see that uh, jesus christ completely uh and definitely abolished a cause death to cease and uh, he has instead given us the life and the life here is the zoe life that is the immortal life the eternal life a life that is unending um unending existence a life that is uncorrupted or not does not have any corruption and we can receive this uh, zoe life this god kind of life this fullness of life when we accept jesus as our lord and savior so jesus came uh you know to completely abolish or cause to cease death and instead he has given us the zoe life the god kind of life the fullness of life okay so we know that death has been defeated on the cross and now we have the zoe life uh, we read this in 1 john chapter 5 verse 11 and 12 and this life uh, and the life of immortality uh, you know we would we are already experiencing here the fullness of the god kind of life here now as we live uh, because we've accepted jesus christ but we will experience it in its fullness in its entirety um in the future uh, you know uh, which is our future inheritance at the resurrection uh, which is mentioned in first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 and 18 you can read that uh, later on and first corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 58 where it says the lord himself will come the dead in christ will arise and mortal will put on immortality that means our bodies are mortal now you know it will put on in immort immortality that means immortality means uh, life uh, unending eternal life and that is the hope we have in the gospel okay so this is uh, the hope that paul is having in his situation now he knows he's going to die any moment uh you know but he's saying that uh, it's not going to end here he has his hope his assurance that he's soon going to see his maker and creator and he's going to receive this eternal life this life immortal okay we'll move on to verse 11 can somebody read verse 11 please verse 11 Paul writes to which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles so he say you know this life which i received the salvation which i received in jesus christ this is what i preach and i'm appointed by god himself to be a preacher and apostle and a teacher to the gentiles so he's 
uh, stating his call, the purpose that God has on his life, his call and his purpose is to, uh, you know, uh, to minister to the Gentiles. Verse 12, can somebody read verse 12? For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. So here we see that, um, you know, uh, as Christians, you know, or believers uh, are called, the calling of God for our life is not exempt from uh, or is not without suffering, hardships, oppositions, and persecutions. Um, we see that Paul is in prison. He is imprisoned, not because of something wrong that he has done, but he is in prison because he is, uh, or he's in chains because of the gospel. And he says he's not ashamed of the gospel. So in earlier in, uh, uh, you know, in this chapter, Paul encourages Timothy not to be ashamed. And now Paul is making his own statement on why he is not ashamed to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Uh, he says, you know, uh, because not only because he is uh, supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit, but he also gives two reasons. The first reason is, he says, I know whom I have believed. And the second reason, he says, is I know he's able to keep what I have committed to him. Okay, so why is Paul saying he's not ashamed of the gospel? The first, uh, the main reason is, of course, he's, you know, he's empowered supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. But he also gives two additional reasons. The first one, he says, is I know whom I have believed. It means... Uh, you know, he knows that the one who he has believed has given him this promise of eternal life, Zoe life, the God kind of life. And the one who has promised this life is Jesus Christ, the Savior, who is the source of grace, mercy and truth, which he mentions in verse one. OK, and he says he has given us immortality. The second thing, uh, the assurance he has, or the reason that he has uh, why he is not ashamed of the gospel, he says, I know he's able to keep what I have committed to him. That means he's able to guard, God is able to guard what I have deposited with him. Okay, that means God is able to protect, safeguard, and keep what Paul has committed to him until that day. Uh, so he's saying, I have placed my life in his hands and he's quite assured uh, and quite confident and very confident that God is able to, to keep what he has entrusted to him. Okay. Now, the second part of this verse could be uh, seen in both ways uh, and both ways are true in their sense. We can see it this way. He's able to guard what has been committed by me to him. Or God is also able to guard what has been committed to me by him. Okay, so both of these ways or, or rendering these, uh, this verse in both these ways are true, that God is able to guard what has been committed by me to him. So whatever we have entrusted to God, our very lives, um, our salvation, our hope, our confidence in him, he's able to guard that. And also God is able to guard what has been committed to us by him. Okay, so whatever he's given us, anointing, the gifts of the spirit, or the fruit of the spirit, um, the calling, uh, the purpose, he's able to guard that, he's able to protect that, and keep it for us and help us and guide us even as we journey through life. Okay, so, um, you know, the, uh, you have given your life, you've entrusted your life, your calling, your ministry, your present, your eternity into uh, the right hands. So it's important who you believe. Okay, if you believe Jesus, then you have entrusted your life, your present, your eternity into the right hands. If you don't believe in Jesus, uh, uh, you know, those who don't believe ha don't have this assurance uh, and they have not placed their life, their eternity, their future in the right hands. Okay, sorry, I took uh, five minutes extra time. I will stop here. 
Uh, anyone has any questions, any doubts? No, if not, uh, we'll end class, okay? Uh, thank you all for joining. Have uh, a good day and I'll see you soon for our next class. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.